Hey, welcome to Let's Talk Human Behavior. Uh, so excited that you are here with us and that you have chosen to spend this time with us. You know, when I started uh, Let's Talk Human Behavior a few years back, I started with a purpose that was tied to a crusade. And that is that uh, I live every day to help people discover three things about their life. I want them to be better. You know, it's it's sad to think about it, but most people live in their circle of sameness and they trap their self. And they talk about what they want to do, but in that circle, they're held a hostage by their self. And the opening of that door is always from the inside, not the outside, because you have to open that door if you want to become better. And then what I've wanted for people, and I still want for them, is I want them to be smarter. Again, it amazes me how many people drop out of the classroom of life. That trapped in that circle, they, they just don't put themselves into the learning experiences that are around them every single day of their life. And so when we do uh, Let's Talk Human Behavior, I try to bring you guests that will challenge your thinking and expose you to new ideas Maybe things you haven't thought about before. And then the third thing that I want is I want you to be stronger. Anyone who knows me knows that uh, I live with the fact there are only two foundations in life. One is when you live from the outside in, and that's where you give up control of your life. And you know you're there because that foundation is built on doubt, worry, and uncertainty. And then you have the choice to live inside out where you are the master of your life. You design your life. You live your life. And you know you're there because in that, in that foundation of living inside out, you're driven by your belief in yourself, the trust that you have in yourself, and the faith that you can because you will. And it's your choice which one you live. And that's the foundation. That's the crusade for Let's talk human behavior. And I have a very special guest with us today. He and I had a chance to talk uh, just a few weeks ago when we were talking about him being a guest with me here on Let's Talk Human Behavior. And uh, Mike Vieira, welcome. Glad you're here. Thank you, Richard. It's great to be here. You know, and I, I know that uh, our listeners don't know a lot about you, so I want you to become their friend. And to do that, a friend is someone that you know about. So tell us about you. Who is Mike? Sure. Uh, well, I'm Mike Vera. I'm a board certified health coach. It's something I'm very passionate about because I am on a mission to wake people up and make the world a healthier place. And I do that with my business, which is Red Pill Health and Wellness. I have my own show, Healthy and Awake podcast. And I spend a great deal of my time talking about influence, manipulation, propaganda, marketing, all the those sorts of things, the things that get us to behave differently. I think that's very important to talk about. So that's really what I'm on a mission to do is to help expose people to these ideas so that they can influence themselves instead of being influenced by others. Well, and, and you're on this crusade um, to wake people up. And one of the things I've found over the years, Mike, is that most people live uh, by allowing their life to, to lull them to sleep and not pay attention to what's going on around them and to not even listen to their own life. Because I think life talks to us. I think our body talks to us. Our mind talks to us. Our emotions talk to us. So what what got you started on this this crusade to wake people up? Uh, well, what got me started was waking up myself. And for me, at 13 years old, uh, that's when it happened. I was just a kid, of course, and this was Napster era. And I had downloaded George Carlin, a well-known stand-up comedian. And this was in his later years when he was saying things like, challenge authority, question everything you read, be skeptical. And as a kid, I had never really heard messages 
like that before, at least not uh, presented in that way. Cause you know, he's there to make people laugh. And, and that was my first time even seeing stand up comedy, which I was fascinated by. And I'm thinking, you know, this guy is just on stage. All these people are here to see him. Uh, he's influencing them in a way to make them laugh, which is an involuntary response. And in addition to making them laugh, he's actually waking them up in the process. He's telling them challenge authority, uh, which is not the most accepted narrative in, in society. And that's something that really stuck with me every day. Uh, that never went away. And here I am today with that same mentality still. And it carries through in every single thing I do. So what awakened, besides that, what awakened you to start this journey that you're on now? Yeah. So more specifically to health, I, I guess Joe, Dr. Joe Mercola was another one who woke me up. And that's when I really started to piece things together. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar or your audience is familiar with Dr. Joe Mercola, but he is a uh, controversial but prominent doctor. Uh, he, I think he might still, if not at, at one point, he did have the most visited health website on the internet. And he says a lot of things that I think need to be said. He talks about some of the corruption within health. He talks about exposing pharmaceutical corruption. And again, I was still a kid. I wasn't 13 years old. But when I started reading these things, I was in my early 20s. And I'm grateful that I discovered him and his work because it allowed me to see the reality of the world, which is that our health is under attack. And so for me, it was never, you know, I, I, I need to get into health so I can talk about salads and push-ups. You know, there are a lot of health coaches out there who talk about uh, all the, the things that you could do for your health. Let's talk about the benefits of olive oil and, and keto and all these different things. And that's great. Um, but that is, is a very small piece of what I talk about because once I really figured out that our health is under attack, it became a mission to defend my health from the attacks. And not only that, to wake people up who had no idea that their health was under attack. And that matters because there is such a thing as the health of a society, the health of the culture, the health of the country. Those things are very important for a prosperous society. And so it's really not just about me. It's not just about me defending my own personal health, but it's really about helping to wake people up so that they can defend themselves, especially if they don't even realize they're being attacked. Uh, so that is really a, a big part of it is, is waking people up to the attacks. And then Mike Art, you, you use the word propaganda, which is a very interesting term. Uh, so are, are you saying that in some ways, maybe a lot of these health organizations or these pharmaceutical companies are lying to us? Well, I'm going to be careful about being that specific. But what I will say is this, I would actually leave that for the individual to determine because there's no argument about whether or not these health institutions are propaganda or are perpetrating propaganda. That's undeniable. When you look at what propaganda is, it is the propagation of information in a coordinated way to shape the thoughts and behaviors of a targeted group of people. Historically, this has always been true. And some governments, some institutions openly do this. You have governments that say, hey, this is our branch of propaganda because they know that's how you communicate values and messages. So when you look at a place like the World Health Organization, or the CDC, they are doing the things that propagandists do. And if you see them as a good organization, you know, they that's fine. They do some good propaganda. They spread information about breast cancer awareness and, and some of the things that you can do to prevent getting breast cancer, right? That is propaganda used for good. Propaganda is a neutral tool. Now, it does seem reasonable to assert that there could be some possible financial conflicts of interest in these large organizations that have a history of partnering up with lobbyists, with former business executives, right? So there's a lot of intermingling there that gives credence to the idea that they could be lying. But again, 
That's not for me to say. I encourage all of my listeners and all the people that I talk to to do the critical thinking for themselves. Just like if I'm a personal trainer, I'm not going to do the push-ups for somebody. They come to me, they have to do the push-ups. I'll kind of nudge them in the right direction, but they have to do the work themselves. And really, the, the reason I do that is because that's the only way to defeat nefarious propaganda is by doing the critical thinking. So I think that's very important. Well, we have an emphasis on health today. It's a big emphasis. And a lot of this is led by the pharmaceutical companies. So are they in the business of pushing medication? Absolutely. I mean, when you look in today's capitalist country, uh, that is what businesses do. And I, I, I don't mean that to be perceived as a criticism of capitalism, uh, but that is one of the results of, of our economic infrastructure is you have a business that creates a model of producing a profit and that's what they have to do, right? That I mean, that's just the way our environment is set up and you can't really knock them for doing what they're supposed to do. Um, you know, I, I want to be careful about getting into the political nature of, of things, but it does seem undeniable that they have a vested interest in getting as many people to take as many of their drugs as possible. And when you start to realize that, you can see some evidence of some of the questionable things that maybe they've done in the past. And there is where I can get more specific. So you look, I mean, these pharmaceutical companies have a history of really doing some egregious things in the name of making money. Can you so, give us an example of that? Absolutely. Yeah. So SSRIs, uh, it's a type of antidepressant. This is from a book called Pharmageddon by Dr. David Healy, who's a world-renowned psychopharmacologist. And he talks about how SSRIs, first of all, the model itself is completely false. This idea that depression is caused by a, a serotonin imbalance and that the answer to that is serotonin in the pills that we're going to sell you. So there's actually something called Case 329. And this is from GlaxoSmithKline, where they actually found that these SSRIs that they still to this day sell for depression, they were not as effective as they are led to be. Not only that, in many instances, they caused harm, uh, sometimes irreparable harm, and even further, instances of people killing themselves, which is kind of the opposite of what you want for somebody to take an antidepressant. And still, if you look at these drugs closely today, they have a black box warning saying that these drugs have a risk of suicidal ideation. Um, that, you know, th there's a lot of complexities to that that would take time to unpack. But my point here is that they had evidence that the drugs they wanted to sell were harmful. And they manipulated the statistics and the data to convey a different message to the doctors and to the public in order to basically justify and get approval for these harmful drugs. And unfortunately, that's not the only instance of this happening. There is, I'll, I'll offer one more example. Uh, this was a few decades ago. Bayer, I think it was in the 90s, Bayer had some drugs for hemophiliacs, for people who have a tendency to bleed more than they should. And for whatever reason, they had a batch of drugs that were contaminated with HIV. So obviously, you don't want to give that to anybody. You want to give people HIV. And so here in the United States, we go, hey, you're not selling that here. You're not allowed to sell this. So thank God for that. But what did this company do? What did Bayer do? They don't want to lose out on all that product. They wanted to still make money. So they sent it to third world countries. This was on the news. This was actually on local news. This was talked about. And this is publicly known that they did this. And I could go on and on. There's countless examples of, of these pharmaceutical companies doing what seem to be very evil things. And it's it's something more people should be aware of. Well, you know, don't want to get too deep into it, but there is a lot of politics involved because we know that the pharmaceutical companies are one of the biggest donators there, there is to political campaigns. 
And so, you know, it's, it's, how do you say this without sounding wrong, but it's almost like they have some of these politicians in their back pockets. And, uh, you know, that makes this even more frightening is that there seems to be a, a lack of maybe oversight concerning some of these drugs. They're also in the politicians' front pockets. So the pharmaceutical <laughs> industry is, I think, the largest lobby in the United States. And the U.S. is pretty unique in that we're, we are one of the only two countries that are allowed to advertise brand name pharmaceuticals to the public. And that's when things can really get messy. New Zealand is the other one, by the way. So New Zealand and the United States. Um, but it, it really does get messy because you look around at the drugs being advertised. You don't see ads for like schizophrenia drugs, right? There's no appeal there. There aren't, there isn't exactly a clamoring and a demand for the average person to seek out schizophrenia drugs. But there are people out there who want to lose weight, plenty of people out there who want to lose weight. And so you see drugs like Ozempic being heavily marketed at the population and presented as if it's the magic solution to all your weight loss challenges. And that can be a problem. I, I know it, it's actually crazy how many people are taking Ozempic and I don't want to go on a tirade against this specific drug. But like all pharmaceuticals, there's a trade-off. There are harms. There are side effects. There are questions about the long-term implications of taking a drug every day for some extended period of time. But the reality is these companies don't do high-quality, long-term, detailed studies on the harms of these drugs. Like if you take them for a year or more, those studies don't exist. That's because the public kind of functions as the long-term studies. There are countless examples of drugs causing harms after it was already in the market. And thalidomide is a perfect example of this. Thalidomide is a drug that was given to pregnant women only to find out that the babies they were giving birth to, many of them were born without limbs, without lit, like missing arms. And this is something that could have been prevented much earlier but it was put on the market and for some period of time it was allowed to harm people continually there's a great book on that called the litamide catastrophe there are some really reprehensible egregious examples of of these horrible things happening that most people don't know about even the people who don't do know about them don't talk about them very often and the worst part of all of this is that these companies continue to operate without really any restraint whatsoever. These things still go on. And you have to wonder, based on the history, based on these specific drugs going so terribly wrong, which ones are out there now still causing harms? I think that's a question worth asking. And, and, and Mike, in some ways, is this a downfall or a, a situational point with the uh, with the FDA? So with the FDA, there's a large portion of drugs that are approved by the FDA that are eventually pulled from the market. It's somewhere near a third. So a little over 33% of all drugs approved to the market are eventually pulled for problems. So yeah, I, I do think it's a failure of the FDA in many instances. I mean, there are so many more harmful things in our food supply, in our drug supply that continue to be allowed that... You know, they don't speak on at all. And this is why I encourage people to question these types of institutions and not to outsource their thinking to these institutions, because especially when you look at the past few years and what happened with the pandemic, there were many people who were all too willing to completely outsource their thinking to the so-called experts. And we do that sort of thing with the FDA when it comes to our pharmaceuticals. And I want to be clear that I'm not saying distrust everyone and everything all the time and become a crazy paranoid lunatic. That is not what I'm saying. There is a time and a place for trusting authority, but you have to do your due diligence. You have to figure out, is this person or this institution worthy of my trust? Let me do some critical thinking to figure this out. Let me try to, if I think that they're worthy of trust, let me try to prove myself wrong. And if I 
fail to prove myself wrong, well, maybe they are in fact worthy of trust. But in this country with the TV that can be oh so hypnotizing, it's very easy for people to not think about these things at all, to not question what's put in front of them. You have a, a professional looking guy in a white coat on TV with a stethoscope around his neck saying just the right things that people want to hear. It's easy to take that at face value. But what I encourage people to do is to take nothing at face value, explore everything further and question your beliefs. So I remember not long ago, I was, I was in a doctor's office and was there for to do my yearly checkup. And there was a lady checking in in front of me. And so they asked her for a list of her medications. And uh, on her list, she had 27 different medications that she was taking. And I sat there and I, I just thought about this, that are we creating a society of maybe uh, through the pharmaceutical companies, uh, junkies. Yeah. Yeah. So what you described is uh, technically poly drug use. And you might have each of those 27 drugs, they could all have their own individual studies on the efficacy, the safety, all those different things. But I can tell you this for sure. There are zero studies on the safety and efficacy of taking that particular combination of 27 drugs. And you see this thing all the time. I think the number is something like five drugs. The average American is on five drugs, which is really sad and unfortunate because you know, one of the biggest health epidemics we have in this country is chronic lifestyle disease related conditions. So that means that a lot of these conditions are reversible by changing your lifestyle. And there's this deeply ingrained inclination here to give people pills for their problems. It's an extremely complex problem issue because you know, the doctors don't have a lot of time to spend with their patients, even if they did have the time there's the challenge of implementation. So the doctor can say, hey, go ahead and exercise and eat right. But it's like telling an alcoholic to drink less, right? So there's this issue of actually implementing the behavioral changes that need uh, to be implemented in order to improve someone's condition. So in this country where we like things fast and as convenient as possible, we want that fast food. We want that Netflix show right now. Well, it can be very tough for people to harness the mentality, I am going to spend the rest of my life working on my health because that's what it is. You know, health is an ongoing process. And if somebody doesn't know that they should be skeptical of their doctor and, and not unreasonably, but be reasonably skeptical of your doctor and have a healthy sense of skepticism, if people don't know that, they're going to stumble into bad decisions. Because again, they've outsourced their thinking. They go, I trust this doctor. I'm going to allow them to think about this for me. I don't know how to think about my blood pressure and what I need to do. I, I just don't know. So I'm going to trust that they're telling me the right thing and I'm going to do what they say. So that is by definition a, a lack of using that part of your brain and instead having someone else do that thinking for you. So... I, I, I forget what the original question was. I hope I answered it, but uh, we, we do need to be skeptical of taking tons of pharmaceuticals on a regular basis. There, Of course, there's going to be problems with that sort of thing. Yeah, we were talking about uh, uh, adult junkies, how the yes. pharmaceuticals yes. come. And, you know, sometimes I wonder if the doctors that are prescribing these medications actually know a lot about the medication or do they go on what the, the pharmaceutical rep tells them about the medication? And how much time do they have to do the research they need to do before they prescribe it? So the pharmaceutical reps do have an influence on the doctors. That's why the pharmaceutical companies spend so much time and effort sending over those reps. They don't do it because they're bored and they want to waste their time. They do it because it does have an impact. But I'll tell you, I talk to a lot of doctors and... I don't think most of them are, you know, corrupt people who just want to take the kickbacks from the pharmaceutical industry. You know, I think most doctors, I would add most older doctors, most like old school doctors 
are not these people who just want to make tons of money from the pharmaceuticals. I think most of these old school doctors, they they do want to make the world a healthier place. But the thing is, propaganda doesn't just target you and I. There is such thing as medical propaganda. The, the pharmaceutical companies aren't dumb. They They make special efforts to influence the way that doctors think, right? So they they shape the way that schools teach certain things. They shape what gets put in the journals. They get they shape what the actual studies say and the demonstration of the statistics. There are all kinds of examples how the doctors are influenced to think a certain way. So again, I think in most cases, it's not because they're being dumb or evil or anything like that. I think they're just misled, most of them. But then again, you have some of these newer doctors who... I do think many of them do get into it for the money. I, I think, you know, because typically you think of a doctor, it's like, oh, well, you're a doctor, you're wealthy, you make money. I think we are starting to see more of that. People who have maybe no interest in actually helping people with their health who thought when they were younger, what am I going to do when I'm older? I want to make money. I want to be important. I guess I'll be a doctor. So those are very different reasons for becoming a doctor. I want to help people versus I want to make money. So there, this is another thing. There's a lot of complexities to it, but I do try to, I, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt and maybe this is naive, but I, I do try to be optimistic about things and I, I see the good in people. Um, I, I just think a lot of them need to realize how they're being manipulated and I think we'll start to see things shift. Mike, do you, do you think that, I want to say this just right, do you think that a lot of the, the pharmaceutical desire and maybe the medical profession is about preventing people from getting sick or wanting them to get sick so that uh, they need their product? I would imagine like so this is a little speculative and borders on on possibly conspiracy theory type thing but I don't think it's unreasonable to think that the pharmaceutical industry would do things to impact people's health in a negative way as a means to ensure that those same people are likely to buy the drugs that solve the problem they instigated. I don't think I don't think that's an unreasonable thought. Um but we definitely do have a sick care system. It's not exactly health care. Uh, we wait till people get sick and then we give them drugs and it's a very broken system. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly why I'm a health coach. That's why health coaches do what we do. So conventionally, health coaches are supposed to be part of this system. So we're supposed to, and maybe I shouldn't say supposed to, but but conventionally, it's thought that health coaches kind of operate within a medical team. So there's the nurses that prep the patient. There's the doctor that sees the patient and prescribes and diagnoses and all those things. And then the health coach comes after and it goes, okay, so you have diabetes. You need to fix your lifestyle. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to meet every week or we're going to meet every other week. And so we're kind of a, a part of that picture. Again, conventionally. But then again, you have health coaches like myself, you have entrepreneurial people who say, hey, I'm not trying to be part of this broken system. Even if you have the best of intentions, the system is broken, it's dying, it's going nowhere. I want to be outside of this system. And that's exactly where I'm at. So I operate as, you know, I have my own business. I took the entrepreneurial path and many other health coaches do this too. So that instead of contributing to a broken dying system that seems to make people more sick than anything else. I mean, you have medical errors through the roof. Uh, we say, look, I'm going to operate here on my own. I'm going to help people in the way that I see fit. And I mean, for me, that's just been the best approach so far. And for the health coaches that I know who also have their own business, it's been very rewarding to you know, not contribute to uh, the broken system. Do you take criticism from other health coaches for the method that you use? No, not overt criticism. I do have people who like shy away from me, people who, you know, they, they hear my business name, Red Pill Health and Wellness, and they see me talking about propaganda 
and they kind of just dismiss me. Uh, fortunately, most people are not like that. It's a very, what seems to be a very select few uh, people who, I don't know why, but you know, they, they see my message, they see what I'm putting out there and, and they don't, I don't know, maybe it just doesn't resonate with them or maybe they find it repulsive in some way because of their own views. But I'm happy to report that maybe 80 to 90% of people who come across my work, they get it, especially nowadays where it seems like people are waking up, people get it. So no, I, I don't really get criticism, at least criticism that has made it to me. Uh, most people have been pretty supportive so far. So hopefully it stays that way, but I am prepared for criticism for sure. Well, it, it's, it seems like that, you know, and in, in, especially in our country today, if you stand outside the norm, okay, then you're wrong. Uh, but you're committed to the fact that what you're doing is right. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm proud of the approach that I'm taking because health coaching has made me a, a more compassionate person a better communicator, you know, because when I'm in my early 20s as a, a high testosterone male, let's say, you know, I speak very directly. I might be more harshly spoken than I should be. Uh, my communication skills are what you would expect a 20 year old's communication skills to be. And the more I got into health coaching and I did the training and I saw some of the errors in my communication style and I was taught how to better communicate and I was learning about ways to practice compassion. And the more you do those things, the better you get at it, especially practicing compassion, you know, because I'm not, I'm not a, a, a discompassionate person, right? I'm not mean or malicious, but just by nature, I'm not the most compassionate person in the world. Uh, I kind of just keep to myself, you know, whatever it means to to not be super compassionate. But when you are in a career where you have to use compassion and you have to help people and the more you do that, the more it kind of ingrains. And so, yeah, I, I'm very happy with the approach that I take. My clients are very happy with it too. And I'm grateful and I feel blessed that I am where I am because you know, the, the skills that I have learned through practicing them, like I said, like communication and compassion, I think a lot of people could benefit from doing those sorts of things more. There is this tendency in the country, especially you look at something like politics, right? You have the red team and the blue team. They're not listening to each other. If they're in the same room and they're having a debate, it's basically like each side is just waiting for the other person to stop talking so that I can say my points, right? I'm just waiting for you to stop saying what you're saying so that I can tell you exactly what I want to say and that'll be it. You just need to hear this thought. That's not exactly how it works. So there's no compassion within a lot of the discussions that we have in the country. There's not a lot of listening going on. And I think uh, those two things can go a long way towards making the country a, a healthier place, towards making our society and our, and our culture a healthier place. Mike, if people wanted to learn more about you and what you do and how you do it, how can they find you? So my official website is redpillhealthandwellness.com, which I realize is a lot to type. <laughs> so if you go to mikevira.com, that will actually redirect you to my Red Pill Health and Wellness website. It actually takes you to a page with all of my social media links, with my main website, with everything else that I have going on. MikeVira.com is the place to go. And are you open to people asking you questions? Oh, always. I love questions. I love people who are supportive. I love people who are critical. I love people who are curious. You know, whatever you got, send it my way. I, I'm happy to engage with people who are in the Healthy and Awake community, which is my group of people, uh, as well as people who you know, have any questions, pushbacks, anything of the sort, I definitely invite that. You know, one of the things I, I, I've i seen is that most people don't get concerned about their health until they get a scare or, or, or they find themselves afraid. Uh, so just on a closing thought, what would you tell people about their need to wake up? I think people 
are really starting to get a sense of what it means to wake up. And there are a, a, a lot of different layers to that, but possibly the most important layer is really the layer of influence. So influence is important to wake up to for what three reasons that I offer. Wake up to the influence, one, so that you can be aware of how you're being influenced. Every time you open up your phone, turn on the TV, talk to a friend, any of these things, you, you're constantly under a barrage of influence. And that's important to realize because you could be influenced to do things that maybe you don't want to do. That's how propaganda works. So that's number one is, is wake up to how you're being influenced. Number two is wake up to ways you can influence yourself. So I want to eat healthier. I want to lose weight. I want to exercise. Okay, what can we do to influence that? What can we change about the circumstances to make it more likely that you'll do that? And, and here's an example. I hear this from clients all the time. I went into Target. I wanted to buy two things. I walked out. I had 10 things. How did that happen? You were influenced. That's not an accident. There are corporate executives that sit in rooms figuring out how can we get you to buy more things? How can we influence these people? So you are able to be influenced and it happens all the time. So how can I influence myself to accomplish the goals that I want to accomplish? And then third, waking up to this idea of influence is what effect am I having? What influence am I putting out there that I might not realize? Because this is another reality. You are influencing people whether you realize it or not. You might not be saying to yourself, hey, how can I go influence this person over there, right? You might not be thinking about that, but the things that you do in an environment where other people can see the things that you're doing, that can have an impact on others. Anybody with kids knows that to be true. If you've ever cursed around your kid and then the next day you hear them cursing, that's an example of how you may have inadvertently influenced somebody else to do something. So once you start to see all these different angles of how you can be influenced and how you can influence yourself and how you can influence others, when you really wake up to this, it's completely life-changing. I mean, because this is constantly ongoing. And I'll add one more thing, if I may. Uh, just like any health coach will talk to somebody about their environment. So you want to lose weight? Let's talk about what your environment is like. Are there snacks in your environment that are sending signals to you to eat these snacks? Do you have like, is your kitchen positioned in a certain way where it makes it easy to bake those cookies or whatever it is? Our environment can impact our behavior. Um, so we can also construct our environment to be more conducive to our goals. Uh, I can go on and on, but uh, hopefully the takeaway there is we need to wake up to influence and the impact that it's having on us. Mike, I want to thank you. I want to thank you very, very much for sharing with us today. And I hope that you've taken the message that Mike has had for you, that uh, you need to wake up. You need to wake up to your health. You need to wake up to what are you doing to yourself? And are you being a friend to yourself? Or are you the enemy that you're fighting? So, you know, Mike, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, you asked such awesome questions. This was a really fun show. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Until we see each other again on the next of our episodes on Let's Talk Human Behavior. Every day, remember this. This is your life. You design it. You live it. And remember, you are exactly in your life where you've chosen to be. I'm Richard Flint, and I'll see you again.